Let's go to John 14. You can be seated or you can stand. It doesn't matter. That's up to you. John 14, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know thou the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I'm going to speak upon the way, or he's got a way. Let us pray this morning. Dear Lord Jesus, I pray anoint these lips of clay, Lord, that I may speak your word of truth this morning with boldness, with authority, and with love, Lord God. But Lord, I am merely a mouthpiece. Let your anointing rest upon me, Lord, that I can speak your word that I feel that you have given to me, Lord. If I've missed the mark, then Lord, switch it on me this morning. But Lord, I feel I've had confirmation in several different things. So, Lord, I pray, anoint these lips that I may speak your word, that someone can hear your word, Lord, that it does not fall void today, Lord, that it will help somebody today, Lord, because I know it helped me. So, Lord Jesus, I just pray that your will will be done this morning in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This message has been confirmed many times um, since I started on it. Even this morning, if you got a bulletin this morning, if you look on the very back, pastor's notes, it confirmed what I'm going to speak about today. So, even pastor and I are in one mind. That's great. That just lets me know that I'm in tune with God as well as my pastor is in tune with God. And we are united together as one. I've noticed since the time that I taught on light and darkness, it's creeped up in everybody's message or lesson since then. Let's me know I was in God's will. That's all I ever want to be is in God's will. I don't want to come up here and give you something that's of me. I want it to be of God. I have been taught how to study the word of God. I could come and give you a flowery message. But... I want it to be God, not me. Because with the day and age that we live in, we need to hear from God. Because we are in a rough, rough patch. This is a world that I didn't even imagine as a kid could happen. But it's all prophesied in God's word. And we've got to do our best to adhere to the way so that we can make it into heaven. Because if we don't, we won't. Um, the way in is um, the word is called hodas. It's in the it's a Greek word because it's in the New Testament. It denotes a natural path, road, what road or way, frequently used in the Synoptic Gospels, personified of Christ as the means of access to the Father. John fourteen and six, which we read. The definition of way, according to Webster's, is a through fare for travel or transportation from place to place. An opening for passage. This door is the only way out of the room. The course traveled from one place to another, a route. So if you wanted to say it's a way from one place to another, he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is no other way. In the book of Exodus, we'll talk about the children of Israel. In chapter 1 of Exodus, the children of Israel were put into bondage. They had a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and he was scared of the children of Israel, and he put them in bondage. Um, chapter 1, 8 through 14, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, 
which knew not Joseph, and he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. He was scared. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasured cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they grieved because of the children of Israel. So the more that the taskmasters laid on them, they still multiplied and were blessed of God. Hmm. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter and with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All the service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. So in all, they had very hard labor, made them work very, very hard. But yet they prospered with all this. But in chapter 2 of Exodus, Moses is born, saved by Pharaoh's daughter. I'm only giving you a summary here. Raised in Pharaoh's home, he flees from Pharaoh and Egypt after he slew an Egyptian, and he dwelt in the wilderness. In verse 23 through 25, in chapter 2 of Exodus, the people, the Israelites, cry out to God for deliverance from the bondage they're in. God hears them and remembers his covenant. So in chapter 3, God tells Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. God made a way. Chapters 4 through 13, Moses returns to Egypt and goes to Pharaoh and tells him, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He doesn't let the children of Israel go and suffers through ten plagues. The Israelites didn't share all the plagues. They were in part of them, but they didn't do all of them. But God made a way for Israel to leave Egypt with great wealth through the blood of the Passover lamb. He made a way for them out of of Egypt, out of their bondage. Out of their bondage. Reminds me of the sacrifice of the spotless Lamb of God on Calvary's tree. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for redemption of mankind from sins. God made a way for a fallen man to return to God's graces. We'll speak more on this later. In chapter 14 of Exodus, Pharaoh's heart is hardened once more and he pursues after the Israelites. Verse 10 through 12 of chapter 14. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children, children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Seems like when we're scared, troubles come, we cry out. The Lord heareth. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt with, thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? So they're blaming Moses that there's no graves in Egypt. Why'd you bring us out here to die? It is verse twelve, it is not this is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone. So they much rather just dwell in Egypt with the bondage than be led. Out is what they're saying here. That we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than, to, than that we should die in the wilderness. The Israelites were scared, as the Bible said, sore afraid, blaming Moses for leading them out of Egypt only to die in the wilderness. But God made a way for them. In verse 16 of the 14th chapter, of Exodus, God told Moses to lift up his rod and stretch out his hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. In verse 21 of that same chapter, Moses does as the Lord commanded him to do. And the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on dry ground through the midst thereof. Once the Israelites were safely on the other side, God told Moses in verse 26 to stretch out his hand over the sea that the waters may come again. Upon the Egyptians. Moses did what the Lord commanded in verse 27, and the Egyptians, Pharaoh and his army, were destroyed. 
God made a way of escape for the Israelites. He heard their cry. He made a way. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar made a idol of gold. And he said, everyone to fall down. And I'm just giving a summary. You'll find this in Daniel chapter 3. That when you hear the music play, to bow down and worship this idol that I have made. Well, the music played, and there's three Hebrew children who did not bow down. They're actually their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But certain Chaldeans came to the king and said, these three did not bow. And the king brought, had them brought to him, and he says, is this true? And they say, yeah, it is true. Shadrach, Meshach answered and said unto the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this manner. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve the gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. This made Nebuchadnezzar very, very angry. He says in that verse 19, he was full of fury. He had to he had the furnace heated up seven times hotter than it normally was. That's hot, people. I mean, it killed the men who bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they threw them in. It killed the men that threw them in. That's pretty hot. And these three, I say, Nebuchadnezzar the king was a Stoned and rose up in haste and spake and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the former, the fourth, is like the Son of God. And Nebuchadnezzar told him to come out of the fire. And they did. Their clothes were not burned. Their hair was not burned. And they didn't have the smell of fire on them. God made a way. But see, they said, even if God doesn't deliver us, he'll deliver us out of your hands, Nebuchadnezzar. So they were prepared no matter what. That is great. And he promoted them. The king promoted them in the province of Babylon after that. He made a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made of dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sword. So it opened up Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. God made a way for them, but in doing so, he made a way for Nebuchadnezzar to see that he's the Almighty God, that there is no other God like him. In Daniel chapter 6, this is the story of Daniel in the den of lions. King Darius was the king at the time. Daniel was in a high place. But there was men who wanted Daniel to be taken out, so to speak. They didn't like Daniel being in this position. And they were trying to trap Daniel. And they came before the king and put this decree about. Let's see if I can find it in the verse here. In other words, I can't find it right now, but what it's actually saying is there was a decree put forth that nobody can pray to any God in, the, in 30 days. It didn't matter what God it was. Nobody could bring petitions before those gods for 30 days. Daniel knew this writing was signed and he went in his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, which if you read in Kings and Chronicles, Solomon, when he built the temple, he says, when they pray towards this temple, which was in Jerusalem, hear them, O Lord. Daniel was praying towards Jerusalem. 
he knelt upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. So Daniel knew of the decree and he prayed anyways. And because of his prayer, God made a way. The Chaldeans came to the Lord King Darius, told him what Daniel had done and according to the decree. And King Darius was troubled. He actually tried to find a way to keep Daniel from going into the lion's den. But they came to him, remind him, and they said, Darius put Daniel in the lion's den. But while Daniel was in the den of lions, the king did not sleep. He was troubled. He was troubled. And in verse 20, when it came, when Darius came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice. He was, he was weeping unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocence, innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad. He was happy and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And he was angry with the people who accused him. Put them and their whole family in the den of lions. And now Darius made a decree. That in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and stand fast forever. And his kingdom, the which that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth who have delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. God made a way for Daniel. He made a way. He shut the mouths of the lions. And he killed the accusers. And he made Daniel a powerful man. Under these two, two kings. Under Darius and Cyrus. In Acts 12, 1 through 17, you got Peter that escapes from jail. Herod had put him in jail for preaching the word. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quartarians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. In other words, when Passover and Easter was done, they were going to put Peter to death. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So people were praying for him. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shined in the prison and he smote Peter on the side, raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. Follow me. Peter's preaching the word. Herod puts him in jail. People are praying. God makes a way for him to escape. And he brings them unto the people that are praying for him. And they don't believe that he's at the door. Um, uh, yeah, the damsel named Rhoda. He's, when he's knocking at the gate, knocking at the door, they hear his voice, but I don't believe it's him. But Peter continued knocking, and they had opened the door and saw him, and they were astonished. But he beckoned unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. God had a plan for him. He made a way. It looked bleak for Peter. He was about to lose his head. People prayed. God opened the doors. He made a way. Peter escaped and went off to another place to do, be about God's business. 
Paul and Silas in Acts 16, verses 19 through 34. And when their masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. I want to trouble this city, to be honest with you, to be known as someone who troubleth this city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them in the innermost part of the prison and made their feet fast in stocks. So they're in the innermost and their feet are strapped down. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them at midnight. That's a whole different message within itself. And suddenly there was a great earthquake. Suddenly. Like the day of Pentecost. Suddenly. There was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened. And everyone's bands were loosed. Everybody in the prison was set free. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he in all his straight way. And when he had brought them to his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with his house. Paul and Silas, locked up, innermost part. Of the jail, bound, they begin to pray and sing God's praises. God made a way. He op- he a great earthquake shook the place. All the feathers and chains that bound were fallen off of every prisoner. And because of that, this jailer found God. He found God. His whole family was saved and baptized. God made a way. It looked like calamity, but God made a way and somebody was saved in the end. God made a way. Now we're going to talk about fall of man in Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 is the story of the fall of man. Verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more subtle or cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto a woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now I don't know where Eve got neither shall you touch it lest we die for it. Because I don't remember God saying anything about touching the tree. All he said was, thou shalt not eat of the tree. But that meant, that's, that's neither here nor there. That's just my opinion. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God hath, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. I wish they never had eaten at that tree. And when the woman saw that the fruit was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, 
And he did it. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. You know, if they had not have eaten it, then we might not be here. We don't know what would happen. But they did eat thereof, and we are here this day, which I'm grateful and consider it a privilege and an honor. In, chapter, in verse 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skin and clothe them. He made coats of clothing for Adam and Eve. Would this not be the first time blood was shed? Mankind? Is this foreshadowing that was to come? The ultimate sacrifice for sins of the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the first time that any blood was shed because he made coats from the skins of the animal. So there had to be some bloodshed. And verse 24, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Even as the Lord was driving Adam and Eve from the garden of Eden, he made a way of salvation. This is a quote from a very famous man. He happens to be our, pa our pastor. And after mankind in rebellion sinned, God provided a way of salvation for all men based uniquely on his grace. This is out of his book, Grace. It's not what you think. From the fall of man, which is basically around 4004 B.C., to the birth of Christ, 4 B.C., 4,000 years, from the death, burial, and resurrection, which is like 29 to 33 A.D. We know that Jesus Christ lived 33 and a half years upon this earth before he was died, before he died, before he gave his life as the ultimate sacrifice. So there was a little over 4,000 years from the time man fell to man's redemption. That's a, that's a long time. During these 4,000 years, part of the plan was the prophecy of the Messiah King. So though it took over 4,000 years from the fall of man to redemption, between all that time, God was making a way, saying that there was a Messiah that's coming, a king, to save Israel. In the Old Testament, it was prophesied that a Messiah slash king was coming to save Israel. But only, not only was his birth prophesied, but where he was going to be born, at what time he was going to be born, and by whom, the virgin, events in his life, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. These prophecies were fulfilled in the New Testament, which you can read about in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is just a side note. If you have a Thompson Chain Reference Bible, there is a chart in the reference material that has the prophecies and the fulfillment. It gives you the scriptures where the prophecy was spoken, and then right beside it, it gives you the scriptures where it was fulfilled. John 16, you know, God made a way for man to return back to him after they had fallen so far. In John 16, 15, I mean, 5 through 13, Jesus is speaking here. But now I go to go my way to him that sent me. So in other words, he's going back to heaven. And none of you asketh me whether goest thou. So he's telling them he's got to leave. But they're not asking him where he's going. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and all righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not of me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He's talking about the Holy Ghost here, the comforter. God said, I must go away or the Holy Ghost cannot come. I must leave. 
he knew that he had to sacrifice his life that we could have life and have it more abundantly. He was the ultimate blood sacrifice. He made a way for us. When Adam fell at the, in the Garden of Eden, he and his God already had the plan in place of salvation for man to come back to him. Already, even though it took over 4,000 years to see the scripture fulfilled, to see that plan in action, he had it in his mind from the day that they fell, even before. He knew man was going to slip up and fall. He knew what was going to happen. So, in Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, 37 and 39, very familiar scripture. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each one. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The fulfillment of the plan. Now when, this is verse 37, now they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. He made a way. We slipped up. We fell in the sin. He made a way that we could come back into his good graces. He made the way. In conclusion, a song inspired me to study out this lesson. The name of the song is He's Got a Way, sung by Southbound. It's a southern gospel group. Every time I hear this song, it ministers to me. I don't know why, but it does. Every time I hear it, it doesn't matter what I'm doing or where I'm at. It ministers to me. And let me read you some of the song. When you're down and out and feel like hope is gone, friends can't be found and you're standing there alone. You say, I'm at the end of my rope. Just hold on tight. There's something you should know. He's got a way of making beauty from brokenness like he did Job. He took and made beauty out of his ashes. He's got a way of breaking chains of hopelessness like he did for Peter and Paul and Silas. When you are feeling like giving up because the road you're on is rough, the road that you're traveling is rough, nothing seems to be going right, Everything's falling apart. Just remember, at the end of the day, he's got a way. So don't ever quit. Just hold on to faith. I promise it won't be more than you can take. He won't put anything on us more than we can bear. I can't count the days he has brought me through. You would be amazed the things I've seen him do. He's got a way. He's got a way. It doesn't matter how dark the situation. It doesn't matter what you're going through. He's got a way. We might not see it. We might not know it. But he's got the way in his hand. He will open those doors. He will open the positions. He will open the, the, sky, the, um, the heavens and pour out blessings that we cannot contain. He's got the way in his hands. So it doesn't matter what we go through to know that he is the way. Not just got the way, he is the way. We shouldn't be glorious at all times. It shouldn't matter what we go through knowing that he is the way. He's already got it planned out from before it even came upon you. He's got it worked out. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. There is none like him. And we can't make it to the Father but through him. He is the mediator. But he and Jesus and he and God are one, though. We all know that. I and my Father are one. 
but he's the mediator. He is the way. There is no other way. There's another song. Jesus is coming back. It's by Jordan Phillies, which is, but IBC on their new CD has it on theirs. It's the second song. I know because I play it over and over and over and over. I've heard both versions. IBC is anointed. So if you can get a copy of that, please do. I always feel something when I hear them sing it. I feel something in my spirit, in my soul. They have the anointing. And I can feel that anointing just through playing it. But there is a lyric in that song that just gets me every time. And when the world gets complicated, are we not living in a complicated world right now? Are we not living in a complicated world? We're going to keep on celebrating, praising him, loving him, giving him the glory and honor that he deserves and desires from his people, praising him, not dwelling in the mully groves. Because he is the way. He made the way. Because we know, yeah, we know Jesus is coming back. Is that not the way? He's coming back for a people that are without spot, without blemish. Who are true worshipers of God. Who have not been deceived. He is looking for a bride. He's coming back for a bride. He's going to split the eastern skies one day. No man knoweth the day nor the hour, but it will happen. We do have a road map here, and the signs of the time are pointing to the second coming of God. He may come in my day. If not, he will come before my children see death. I believe that with my whole heart because it's his word and it's being fulfilled before our very eyes. He made a way of salvation. He is the way. We can't go to heaven without him. Even in John, when he told Nicodemus in the, in the third chapter, we can't enter or even see the kingdom of heaven if we are not born again of the water and of the spirit. Acts 2.38 fulfills that. Be, repenting of our sins, being baptized in Jesus' name, the only name under heaven where we must be saved, and receiving his gift. Of the Holy Ghost. Speaking in tongues. That the Spirit gives the utterance. This is not something taught. This is a gift. That people receive. You've got to have faith and believe. To receive that. Which is holy. I mean. We were. We all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were all sinners. Saved by grace. We've all been through this process. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you've repented of your sins, you've been baptized in his name, and you've received his gift. It doesn't make us better than anybody else. We should be a humble people to reaching out to other folks. God is the way. He is the way. There is no other way. If there is another way, I haven't found it. Pastor hasn't found it. This is the only way. I've been in Pentecost since the age of 11. I was 14 when I received the gift of the Holy Ghost. God made a way for me. I was shy and backwards. I wouldn't speak to nobody. Now you can't shut me up. But that's because of the Holy Ghost. He made a way for me. I knew nothing of this. Nothing. I just know when I first got in the Pentecostal church, I sat on the edge of my pew. Because it's like, wow. There's nothing like this. I was entranced at an early age at what was going on. It took me a while to get the Holy Ghost, like I said, because I was I was shy. I couldn't speak out. It took me a minute. But we had a, um, a visiting missionary. I was 
up under the leadership of a William C. Christ in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And he preached. And that night he had a, um, what is it, a prayer pool, so to speak, prayer line. And I got the Holy Ghost in between the pews. About a year after my brothers did, but, you know, I'm hard-headed. No, I'm just kidding. Like I said, it took me a while to open up. But God has opened me up through the Holy Ghost. I mean, normally I would not be able to stand before y'all. I'm just being honest. It's taking God to deal with me, to be able to speak to people about his truth. He made a way for me. I mean, I could have been long gone out of this world a long time ago. A long time ago. But it's by his grace I am still here today because he made a way. He's making a way for me now. I might not see the hand that is working. But my present situation is a tough one. But my God is making the way. I believe that. Maybe that's why that song ministers to me like it does. Because I know I'm in a situation that I have no control over. I don't know what to do. But I know a God who has the way planned out. All I got to do is follow him. And he will open that door. If I do what I know I'm supposed to do, God will do what he said he will do. It's always a two part. You know, it says, if my people which are called by name humble themselves and pray. That's what we have got to do. He will heal the land. He will make the way because he is the way. There's nothing that we are faced with. He cannot fix. He cannot. It's impossible for God not to. If we ask, God will do. But we must ask. If we don't ask, God ain't going to do it. That's just what I tell my kids. If you don't ask, I'm not going to get, I don't know what you want, and I can't give you what you want because you don't ask. If we need something from God, we need to ask and believe, have faith that He will do it and live up to His expectation of us because He designed us to worship Him. Adam and Eve in the garden, he came in the cool of the day and they fellowshiped one with another. We were here to fellowship with our God. And when man fell, it broke his heart that he made a way of salvation that we could come back to him. And he opened the door for us Gentile people. He made a way for us to be a part of of his body of Christ. He made that way. He dealt with Cornelius. He sent Peter. And as Peter spoke. He received the gift of the Holy Ghost. About 3,000. Added to the kingdom of God. He made a way. For us to have this salvation. Had a way for us. To sort of. Have a way out of sin. We are born into sin. These bodies, this flesh is sinful. It is the Holy Ghost and fire that keeps this flesh in check. When you have been born again of the water and of the spirit, the Holy Ghost keeps that flesh in check. When you start, when that flesh starts to roll up, he'll let you know. He says, you need to put that flesh under subjection. You need to crucify that flesh. That's why it says, I'm crucified with him, yet I live. My flesh dies to this world, but my spirit lives. And as Holy Ghost filled people, we're supposed to live a life that is full. A full life under his power and glory, if we allow it. Yes, we all have our problems. Yes, we all have Situations that we face, trials and tribulations. But 
God is the way. Tap into him and your problems would be taken care of. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for using these lips this morning, Lord, to speak your word. For truly, Lord, you are the way. You make it everything under heaven and earth. Lord, you've made it all by just speaking it into existence. So, Lord, you have spoke, you formed man in your presence, Lord. You formed us to be like you. So, Lord, let us be like you, O oh God. Let us walk in the way that is straight and narrow, Lord God. We look not to the left nor the right, but our eyes are focused upon the prize of the high calling, O oh God. Yet let us walk humbly before thee, but yet boldly in prayer that we come before thee, O oh God, against our enemies and adversaries. For, Lord, we are not a weak people. We are strong and mighty through the power of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Ghost and fire, the pulling down of strongholds in our minds, in our cities. Lord, there is nothing that we cannot do in you if we allow you to do the work, Lord God, to know and have our minds set upon thee, knowing, Lord, that you are the way. It doesn't matter how dark the night may get, how dark the day may get. You are coming back. You have made a way of escape from this world that we dwell in, O oh God. You have made a way, Lord Jesus, when you died upon that cross, when you shed your life's blood. Lord, when you gave up the ghost, you made a way for mankind to come back to thee. O oh Lord Jesus, and I am truly grateful, Lord, for what you have done. For, Lord, without all that, we would not be here today. If you had not given yourself as the ultimate sacrifice, none of us would be here today, oh God. Lord Jesus, and I am grateful, Lord. I am grateful that you have done all these things and made a way that I can live a life that's holy, that is acceptable unto thee, oh Lord God. Giving you the praise that you deserve, that you desire, that you want from your people. For God, you didn't have to do what you did. But the fact that you put life in me, gave me breath, is all the more reason to worship you, Lord God, to praise you, to magnify you, and to give you what is due you, O oh God. Lord Jesus, I just pray, Lord, your hand be upon all these great people that are here, Lord. Lord, that, you, that they can just understand that you are the way. That it doesn't matter what they are faced with. You are the way. You are the way. You can open the doors that seem to be closed. You can make the way. You can. You are the God. You are the creator. You are everything that we'll ever need. So Lord Jesus, I just pray that you just put that in our hearts, in our minds. That it's always there knowing you are the way. And we can overcome anything. Because you are the way. In Jesus' name, amen.